Good afternoon. Today I'm going to discuss with you some important updates in the nephrology, and I'll uh, uh, start with nephroradiology, followed by nephropathology, and I'll end with important articles, and I'll concentrate on key messages of the articles. Let us to start with the value of CT. So this is CT without contrast on the pelvis, showing clearly vascular calcification of penis. In a case with calciflexis and diabetes, with end-stage kidney disease, so if we are confronted with gangrene of the penis due to vascular calcification, the best is to do the treatment before thinking of the Nile uh, benectomy, either partial or total. The advances in ultrasound, this is the three-dimensional ultrasound of the allograft and showing here the stenosis, as you see. Another film, the CT, formatted, reformatted image showing arthrostenosis, and this is the, you can see, the salutary function in kidney with arthrostenosis. This is the Doppler of the main artery showing high velocity, and the intrarenal uh, indices show the uh, typical wave here you can see delayed time to big velocity because uh, the normal wave there is abrupt in the normal wave, there is abrupt rise here this is a delayed time to big ve velocity or prolonged time to big velocity tardus and here there is when this is uh, small so you can say it is parvus wave so this is a typical intrarenal wave uh, of renal arthrostenosis. So at the level of stenosis, you will find high velocity and the intrarenal vessels shows, show the presence of uh, tardus barvas wave. This is a very interesting case because this case, when angiotensin septal blocker was added, there was a abrupt decline of kidney function that necessitated stoppage and discontinuation of angiotensin receptor blocker. Unfortunately, the patient suffered from flash pulmonary edema after this that necessitated revascularization. After revascularization, everything uh, uh, was fine and the, the angiotensin receptor blocker was uh, resumed with better management of blood pressure. So, the, I want here to stress upon two issues. The indication of revascularization is critical indication like acute renal failure, acute decompensated heart failure, and the uh, intolerability of antihypertensive medication or refractory hypertension. All these are clinical indications for revascularization. The second point, I want to ask you a question. Is there a rule for captopyrinography? The answer is the rule is very limited. And for myself, I consider Renogram just to assess the clearance of that kidney before justification of nephrectomy. What is this? This is a coronal MRI imaging showing the presence of uh, polycystic kidney and some cysts in the liver. So, this is a case of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. This is a man who had a child and he failed to have the second child, so the man is suffering from secondary infertility. The question why? From the radiology, you can find here, this is the enlarged seminal vesicle, bilateral enlargement of seminal vesicles. It's not necessarily to have cystic seminal vesicles in a patient with polycystic kidney, but you may find enlargement of polycystic kidney. And the enlargement of polycystic uh, sorry, enlargement of seminal vesicles leads to exhaustion of sperm and may lead to infertility by degeneration of sperms. So this is a new addition for you regarding the extra renal affection in polycystic kidney disease. Besides diverticulitis or diverticulosis, the circle of Willis aneurysm and he, uh, mitral valve overlaps and here seminal vesicle enlargement. Okay. So, if this is MRI, and this is for the early diagnosis of diabetic nephropathy, so what is 
this technique. This technique is arterial spin leveling. You can see here, this is a normal person. Everything is normal. And this is the perfusion in a patient with diabetes. And although there was no problems within the kidney, kidney function is accepted, and there is no abnormality in urine analysis, but as you see, there is a difference in this study from a normal person. So this study aims to evaluate renal blood flow milli per minute per 100 gram of renal tissue. As you see, this is a normal, and this is the diabetic patients. So in type, type 2 diabetes, the early finding is a reduction of renal blood flow as evidenced here by this uh, type of MRI study. So to detect silent diabetic kidney disease, we either depend upon biomarkers or we may think of MRI technique like what I explained. Let us to read this case. This is a 23-year-old Japanese woman was admitted with asymptomatic proteinuria and hematuria. An ultrasound assistic, assisted percutaneous renal biopsy was performed. Three days later, she experienced sudden onset left back pain when picking up a heavy bag. Uh, I put this case just to stress upon educating patients uh, about renal biopsy before, during, and after. So after doing a biopsy, for two weeks, the patients shouldn't carry heavy objects or strain so to uh, allow the wound to heal. So this is the CT scan. So this is CT scan with contrast. As you see, the kidney here is fine, but there is a big hematoma in this kidney, and the patient was managed conservative after nine months as you see the kidney here is atrophic so this is a beige kidney and the beige kidney this is the old terminology uh, describing the compression of the kidney by collection like hematoma and it was usually prescribed in traumatic kidney injury but here this is after kidney biopsy so the main message is to handle the case of biopsy in a proper manner Let's just go to the pathology corner. If this is a diabetic patient, what is your diagnosis? The diagnosis is nodular sclerosis. So this is a nodular sclerosis. As you see, everything is clear. And there is hyalinosis of the vessels. So and this is a small vessel with hyalinosis. So the nodular sclerosis is a stage 3 diabetic nephropathy from the pathology perspectives. I have a question here. Is nodular sclerosis specific for diabetes? The answer is no, because uh, we have a long list of differential diagnosis of nodular sclerosis up to smoking and hypertension. So the more specific for diabetic nephropathy is hyalinosis of the vessels. And this is the classification of diabetic nephropathy. Although it starts with class one, then two, three, and four, but the professional pathologists start to read the pathology by asking himself or herself is there any advanced diabetic glomerular sclerosis if the if there is advanced diabetic glomerular sclerosis this is stage 4 or class 4 if not no advanced diabetic glomerular sclerosis is there nodular sclerosis kimmel style wilson nodule so it is nodular sclerosis or class 3 and then if there is no nodular sclerosis if there mesangial expansion, if it is mild, so uh, the uh, less than 25% of observed, observed mesangium, uh, it is 2A, and if it is above 25% of the observed mesangium, there is mesangial expansion, it is 2B. If there is no mesangial expansion, but there is uh, thickened basement membrane, uh, so basement membrane thickness is exceeding 395 nanometer in females or 430 nanometer in males. This is stage one. Provided that electron microscopy uh, doesn't reveal any deposition. So this is the classic pathology of diabetic nephropathy. If this is a patient 
who has diabetes and biopsy was carried out because of uh, proteinuria and this is the electron microscopic appearance this is a classic deposition here this is epithelial side and this is endothelial side so this is sub epithelial deposition and sometimes intramembranous deposition so this is a classic membranous nephropathy superimposed in a diabetic patient this is a patient who presents with acute renal failure what is your diagnosis please look carefully to this hematoxylin you've seen uh, stained specimen here this is the cast with multiple uh, with many inflammatory cells so this is inflammatory cast and here there is interstitial edema so this is a case of acute bilonephritis another case of chronic this is classic chronic tubular interstitial nephritis and this is a, a very interesting case it, it was uh, published within this article that discussed the issues of acute kidney injury due to tropical infections infectious diseases and uh, animal venom a tale of two continents so this is the title of the manuscript let us go to uh, the pathology and radiology so this is the classic pathology of cortical necrosis and this CT scan with contrast so the axial cut with uh, contrast because aorta is here and this is the vein if we concentrate on the kidney this is the enhanced renal capsule and the medulla but the cortex is not enhancing this means that there is cortical necrosis it's a very interesting article about tropical infection and you can ask yourself about this combination and the differential diagnosis fever and jaundice what are the causes by physic fever and conjunctival suffusion plus rhombocytopenia and transaminitis what are the causes Continuous fever and severe respiratory symptoms leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome. What are the causes? Fever and severe myalgia, thrombocytopenia, uh, calculus, uh, cholecystitis. What are the causes from the tropical infection? Fever, fever, macrobiotic rash, uh, fever and splenomegaly, thrombocytopenia, fever and exposure to uh, unpasteurized, unpasteurized milk product fever and diarrhea so you can ask yourself and you just uh, try to answer the questions and then look at the answer and uh, more importantly is to go to this article and to read it in details so you can hear fever and jaundice leptospirosis malaria dengue yellow fever hantavirus you can go to the combination and look at the diagnosis and differential diagnosis so it's very interesting this is a case of renal transplant and the patient presents with chronic allograft dysfunction. What is the pathology diagnosis? As you see, this is a chronic changes, changes within the cortex and here duplication of internal elastic lamina. So this is a, if, we, if we can we, we can say if the interstitial fibrosis and tuber atrophy was chronic change in the vessels. And here the question how to differentiate between if the due to chronic antibody immunity rejection and other etiologies is to look at the presence of C4D and the presence in the pretubular capillaries and as well in the serum we can search for the presence of donor specific anti chile antibodies to differentiate chronic antibody immunity rejection this is a very nice uh, slide shows the presence of a thrombotic microangiopathy so this may be a a manifestation of calcineurin inhibitor nephrotoxicity to differentiate it be, be, between calcineurin nef nephrotoxicity and acute antibody mediated rejection because acute antibody mediated rejection may present with this um, pathological presentation thrombotic microangiopathy again we need to look at donor specific antibodies another important appearance here in the vessels this is high nosis of the vessel but here as you see the high nosis reaches the media of the vessel so this is arterial high nosis uh, documenting the uh, uh, calcineurin nephrotoxicity with nodular high nosis extending to the media here this differentiate from the diabetes and hypertension which is uh, usually 
hyenosis is usually, usually restricted to the intima. So if we find hyenosis extending toward the media, it may refer to calcinurin nephrotoxicity. This is a very interesting article that uh, was published in this journal uh, this month about the hyenosis lesions in renal transplant biopsies. And uh, I, here, this is a Kaplan-Meier curve. As you see, if arterial hyenosis is severe, AH3, and you can know the degree of hyenosis by looking at the criteria in BAMF. So you can read at the zero, one, two, three, hyenosis. And you just, I want to uh, discuss with you another interesting point in this slide. If you look here, graph survival for patients with arterial hyalinosis mild degree, arterial hyalinosis one is even is superior to the absence of hyalinosis. Do you have an explanation or this is a typing error in the article? It is not typing error because mild arterial hyalinosis may be the print, fingerprint of the use of calcium inhibitor reflecting adherence to management and the absence of hyalinosis may be a reflection of non-adherence. So, the severe form of arterial hyalinosis is bad, but mild degree may reflect the uh, adherence to treatment. What is this? This is, as you see, this is vasculitis, encroachment on more than 25% of the vessel lumen, so it is V2, uh, so this is cellular rejection, grade 2 B. And here, this is the vessel. All layers are infiltrated with inflammatory cells. So this is V3, grade 3, acusial rejection, and it may be combined with antibody immediate rejection. This is a very interesting, this is a kidney transplant patient with, uh, that was complicated by multiple myeloma. And after receiving uh, immunomodulatory drugs, the patients succumbs in a graft failure or acute. This is a typical tubulitis. As you see, this is the basement membrane, and this is infiltrating lymphocytes within the renal tubules. So this is tubulitis. And another uh, segment of the slide shows vasculitis. So this is the reflection of the use of this drug, the lena lidomide, which is the salidomide derivatives, uh, can be used in multiple myeloma. And this slide summarizes or this table summarizes the chemotherapeutic agents mechanism of action and the type of malignancy uh, that uh, we can use this drug for the malignancy treatment so we have ibilumab which is ctla4 and this is one of the checkpoint inhibitors nivolumab which is bd1 in uh, antibodies against program this one and it can be used in lung cancer and um, hepatocellular carcinoma melanoma renal c carcinoma uh, so this is uh, a complication you may find tubulitis and for the native kidney you may find interstitial nephritis and this is interleukin 2 this is a, a spilu set which is in cell therapy so all these are immune chemotherapeutic agents that can lead to uh, immunological reaction within the graft or the native kidney so the last sector is the articles and the practical messages so regarding hepatitis E, since a long time we consider hepatitis E, the hepatotropic virus, just the patient will present with hepatic manifestation. But today I'm going to discuss with you that you can find extra renal, extra hepatic manifestation of hepatitis E virus, like neurological manifestation, amyotrophy, glian barre syndrome, cryoglobulinemia, glomerulonephritis and even MBG and glomerulonephritis, acute pancreatitis, hematological diseases, meningitis, etc. So here I'm going just to uh, pay your attention toward the extra hepatic manifestation of hepatitis E and the key point from this article that uh, is published this month that neurological and renal diseases may be or are very likely to be causally related to hepatitis E virus infection. And if we diagnose hepatitis E after organ transplantation, the treatment is to reduce immune suppression and to give a So regarding the 
lupus nephritis. There's another interesting article. Uh, uh, we should respect the pathological finding, uh, uh, like uh, crescent, crescent, fibrin necrosis, etc. But this article calls for respecting as well the clinical parameters like progression of kidney function in a patient with lupus nephritis, and we are waiting the validity of clinical and histopathological parameters that predict the outcome. Another article which is very important is uh, diagnosis and the treatment of hyponatremia. And this is a very nice algorithm. If you have hyponatremia, exclude hyperglycemia and other causes of non-hypotonic hyponatremia. So if you are left with hypotonic hyponatremia, then ask yourself, is there any acute symptoms or severe symptoms? Treat first. So consider immediate treatment with hypertonic saline. If there is no acute or severe symptoms, start your algorithm by looking at urine osmolality. You may find osmolality less than 100 mosmomol per, per, per kilogram. This may be because of primary polydipsia, low solid intake, or beer uh, ingestion. So all these are causes of this uh, uh, hyponatremia with uh, low urine osmolality. If urine osmolality is above 100 or equal 100, uh, look at urine and sodium. It may be less than 30 millimole per liter or above 30 millimole per, millimole per liter. If it is less than 30 millimole per liter, so uh, uh, look at the, uh, if, uh, the blood volume. Here in this scenario, if the urine sodium is less than 30, there is a reduction of effective arterial blood volume. So if you examine the blood volume, the extra cell volume, and you find it is expanded, in the presence of congestive vein, crepitation, rods, edema, you may be uh, in this zone, heart failure, liver cirrhosis, and nephrosis syndrome. If there is a contracted extra cell volume uh, fluid uh, signs, like sunken eyes, dry axilla, and the bursa hypotension, so this may be because of diarrhea, vomiting, uh, third space lossing or diuretics. If the urinary sodium is above 30, uh, ask yourself if the patient treated with diuretics or not. If not, assess extra cellular fluid. If it's contracted with vomiting or renal salt wasting, if it is normal, you may consider syndrome of an appropriate and diuretic hormone secretion uh, or secondary adrenal insufficiency, hypothyroidism considered occult diuretics um, as cause in this scenario. So it is very simple. Just to look at blood, uh, bl uh, uh, plasma glucose, uh, serum osmolality, and then urine osmolality and urine sodium and the clinical evaluation of volume status. And in this review of guidelines, you will find the challenge by normal saline if you are not sure if the hydration is present or absent. So you can give saline if the hyponatremia is worsened. This means that there is no high dehydration. If it's improved, this may be a clue for uh, dehydration. Regarding the syndrome of inappropriate and diuretic hormone secretion. Here, this is plasma cobalt-10. This is an index of diuretic hormone, and this is serum osmolality. The normal relationship between serum osmolality and the plasma Cobalt-10, which is the representative of antiretic hormone, uh, you can find here if serum osmolality increases, antiretic hormone increases, and here you can so this is the shaded area here. This is a normal relationship between serum osmolality and uh, the plasma antiretic hormone or uh, vasopressin. But all others, as you see here, type A. Type B, type C, type D, and type E are inappropriate. So, for inappropriate and diuretic hormone secretion, we have five types. Regarding the E type, it is reversed, so it is a barostat reset. And here, there is no relationship between osmolality and diuretic hormone is inappropriate. So, uh, it is the diuretic hormone is very low in all phases of osmolality, and here is very high. So, you can look at the line and you can understand what is in this uh, drawing 
Another important point in this article is to show the difference between United States guidelines and the European guidelines. So if you have acute symptomatic hyponatremia uh, in the United States, start a bolus 3% sodium chloride, uh, 100 uh, milliliter over 10 minutes, and you can repeat uh, up to three times as needed. But in the European guidelines, start the bolus 3% sodium chloride, 150 milliliter over 20 minutes, uh, over uh, 20 minutes, two to three times as needed. You can go all through this article to know how to diagnose and how to manage hyponatremia. Another important article, this is a systematic review uh, and meta-analysis suggests that obesity uh, can be associated and predicts the onset of chronic kidney disease in general population. So this is the systematic review and meta-analysis of 39 cohorts, including more than half a million participants with mean follow-up of six, uh, more than six years. So again, obesity is bad and we should combat obesity in, the, obesity, obesity in general population by advising of not uh, uh, gaining weight in the general population. And a more important study for nurse and other health professional. This is a very nice study because it included 225,000 men and women with uh, death in 32,000. And this was observation for more than 12 years. Here, the, it's very interesting because here for all participants, it is not only the baseline but the maximum body mass index. So we look at the history of body weight. So here, if the maximum body mass index is high, overweight or obese, as you see here, the mortality is high. And here for all participants and here for the persons who never smoke. So again, uh, we should combat uh, obesity and weight gain. Regarding uh, the presence of retinopathy in a patient with diabetes, it is, is it good or bad? Because when we are confronted with the patient with nephropathy and he is diabetic, we ask for fundus examination, searching for the presence of or absence of retinopathy. But the presence of retinopathy is not good news. It's bad news. Why? Because it predicts here, the presence of retinopathy here, if it is, the shows that the hazard risk for indecision kidney disease is higher than one. This means it predicts the occurrence of indecision kidney disease, the uh, predict the uh, occurrence of rapid renal progression, and predict all cause mortality. So the presence of retinopathy re uh, refers to the diabetic nephropathy, but it is not good news beca because it uh, it is a predict for uh, progression of kidney disease and for mortality. The question is, uh, should all patients with diabetes have a kidney biopsy? I cannot say yes for all diabetic patients that we should do biopsy. But the threshold for doing a biopsy currently for diabetic patient is lowered. So if there is any suspicion of non-diabetic kidney disease superimposed on a diabetic patient, it's better to do biopsy because this may uh, solidify the diagnosis of non-diabetic kidney disease and the outcome for the non-diabetic kidney disease in a diabetic patient or superimposed non-diabetic on top of diabetic nephropathy. Uh, both scenarios carry uh, uh, superior prognosis to the diagnosis of diabetic nephropathy per se, because diabetic nephropathy is associated with poor outcome. Again, we should restrict the use of metformin in the advanced stages of chronic kidney disease, and it's better to avoid it at all if estimated GFR is less than 30 ml per minute. And if we use it in the advanced CKD in stage 4 and 5, we shouldn't exceed 500 milligram, provided that we can follow up the patients and we educate the patients to stop metformin in six days. 
Here, this is the case of acidosis, the two metformin lactic acidosis, the high anion gap acidosis. The most important point, if we are confronted with severe metformin associated or induced lactic acidosis, the, uh, this may be an indication for dialysis. And here I want to say that short dialysis is not efficient and effective in detoxification of the patient, and we should depend upon long dialysis. So this is even after 16 hours of sled, and then dialysis was discontinued. There was rebound in lactic acidosis. This necessitated, even if we uh, perform long dialysis session, we should continue follow up the rebound of lactic acidosis after that. This is regarding diabetic nephropathy uh, uh, because we are confronted with many articles that were published in the previous decade showing disappointment in the management of diabetic kidney disease. This is from the molecular point of view. This is uh, a very recent article showing the role of uh, EBA uh, galactikin galate be in the management of diabetic nephropathy here. The problem in diabetic nephropathy is excessive oxidative stress leading to inflammation, fibrosis, and diabetic nephropathy. So if we use this molecule, which is present in green tea, it binds to keep one, which is clutch like ACH associated protein one. When it binds to keep one, uh, the keep one is associated from nuclear factor is really two related uh, uh, factor and this will antagonize the best way of oxidative stress so this is from molecular point of view and this is just an example of studies that show that we are searching for new molecules to be target for new treatment and not going to solidify or giving evidence-based medicine for using the green tea or whatever for management of diabetic nephrology but this is one uh, example that the scientists are searching for the management of diabetes and we need a lot of research. Another point of research in diabetes is how to predict the progression of chronic kidney disease in diabetes. According to Joslin cohorts in type 1 and type 2, there was solidification of the role of TNF receptor 1. And in this study, not only TNF receptor 1, but receptor, TNF receptor 1 plus 2 plus chem kidney injury molecule 1 are important in prediction or progression of coronary kidney disease. And this is the models and odds ratio uh, for the renal endpoints showing that in these two cohorts, the TNF receptor 1, TNF receptor 2, and the chem 1 are working well after the many adjustments. Another important point in the diabetic person, the renal length, because you may say that the, the longer the length of the kidney, the better the outcome. But in this uh, uh, paper, the reverse is there. The bigger the kidney and the more, the higher the length of the kidney, the more the prediction of cardiovascular outcome because the long kidney may predict the or may diagnose the presence of a hyperfiltration that is linked to, with the start of the pathology. So I finished the hyper diabetes regarding the hypertension. This is a very nice article showing that acute decline in renal function by more than 20% after starting antihypertensive treatment is a bad predictor and is a predictor for future development of end stage kidney disease. Irrespective to the target of management of blood pressure, either intensive or not. So this is a very interesting practical point is to look at kidney function before and after starting antihypertensive treatment. If there is acute decline of kidney function, this is a bad predictor for the development of indecision and disease in the future by more than 20 percent. Another interesting point is the use of spironolactone like is safe. The use of spironolactone like in, in coronary kidney disease stage 1 and 2 may be beneficial in the majority of situation 
uh, even up to CKD stage 3. But for stage 5, this a very nice study uh, addressed the effects of spironolactone on the risks of mortality and hospitalization for heart failure in pre-dialysis CKD stage 5, a, national, a nationwide population-based study including large number of patients as you see the users of spironolactone are more than 1,300 compared to non-users uh, so this is a very nice study showing that the use of spironolactone in a stage 5 CKD stage 5 is bad and associated with higher cardiovascular death infection related death and was very strange for me and heart failure related this may be because of increasing the acidosis because spironolactone may increase acidosis plus hyperkalemia and the infection may be because it interferes with cytokines etc so you can read the article to know in the discussion why it increases infection so the main message is it's better to avoid uh, spironolactone in advanced stages of chronic kidney disease pre-dialysis stage 5 chronic kidney disease another interesting article that uh, uh, is uh, impressed this is management of gout and hyperglycemia in chronic kidney disease and I advise and recommend that all nephrologists read this article because it includes many practical points including modification of drugs like aloprenol and fibroxate here if, if you look at aloprenol the starting dose is 50 to 100 milligram the maximum dose is 800 milligram per day uh, this is in general but in stage 3 and 2 5 if estimated GFR if creatine clearance is above 30 milli per minute start with less than 100 milligram and it goes slow if uh, cl clearance is, le is less than 30 milli per minute it's st uh, the starting dose is 50 milligram per day uh, for patients on intermittent hemodialysis should be administered post dialysis and start with 100 milligram on alternative day post dialysis and for daily hemodialysis patients ad additional 50 percent of the dose may be required post dialysis for fibroxate the classic is to start with 40 milligram and the maximal approved is 80 milligram and maybe 120 milligram in euro but in patient with a stage uh, uh, three to five chronic kidney disease there is insufficient data about the use of a fibroxate state in patient with creatine clearance less than 30 milli per minute despite in dialysis despite some successful reports of dialysis patients using fibroxate state up to 80 milligram per day this agent is not FDA approved for the use in dialysis patients due to a lack of trials in this population so this is a very important point in advanced stages of chronic kidney disease and on dialysis if we would like to use it's better to use albuterol in very modified dose according to the GFR regarding colchicine this is a, a normal kidney function uh, we can use it in six in 0.6 milligram every 12 hour once daily may be sufficient but in patient with uh, chronic kidney disease if creatine clearance is more than 30 milli per minute dosage adjustment is not needed but if it is less than 30 milli per minute initial dose to be 0.3 milligram per day and caution if up titrated and monitor closely for adverse effects and here in dialysis patients not re removed by dialysis this is a very important point colchicine is not removed by dialysis and in dialysis there is an increased risk of myo neurotoxicity which is the whole mark of the uh, colchicine uh, my, uh, toxicity syndrome and the fda label states that colchicine to, is to be used in a dose of 0.3 milligram twice per week with close monitoring for toxicity okay so what about the colchicine toxicity manifestation and the, the risk factors for colchicine toxicity the toxicity manifestations the most common manifestations are neuromuscular toxicity 
that may manifest uh, mild, mildly as tingling sensation or subjective weakness or severely as overt peripheral neuropathy with axonal degeneration and rhabdomyolysis. Common manifestations, proximal uh, muscle weakness, elevates from creatinine kinase, neuropathy or myopathy on electromyography. Blood disc crisis like myelosuppression, aplastic anemia, gastrocyte manifestation, roxanosia, vomiting, bloating, diarrhea, pharyngeal pain, and the grave is current uh, is death. What are the risk factors for cortisone toxicity? It, uh, the risk factors include decreased kidney function, especially advanced CKD and on dialysis, because as I mentioned, it is not dialyzable. Hepatic dysfunction. In elderly patients, patients who are receiving statins, fibrates, uh, high dose of colchicine, concomitant use of p glycoprotein or cytochrome B3A4 inhibitors such as calerythromycin, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, antifungal drugs, calcium shine blockers like verabamil deltazem, and grapefruit juice. So we should be careful when we use seen in coronary kidney disease patients and the special alert concomitant use of colchicin with big lycoprotein or cytochrome B3A4 inhibitors, especially telerithromycin, is contraindicated in patients with coronary kidney disease as it can result in death. This is the answer of the candidates of MD nephrology and the green bar here uh, is referring to the uh, candidates uh, who had the best answer. Another interesting point is FIBOC state associated myopathy in patients with chronic kidney disease. This is a study that included uh, more than 1,300 patients. 1,222 had chronic kidney disease. In these patients, 41 had myopathy and the presentation of myopathy, either myocytis or rhabdomyolysis. And the most important risk factor is the advanced CKD. So again and again and again, it's better uh, not to use fibroxate in a stage 5 chronic kidney disease and in dialysis patients. This is another study discussed the issue of using hypoglycemic drug and to target blood pressure control. This is a randomized control trial, uh, including this number of patients, 47 persons are treated with proven seed, 49 with albuprenol, and 53 uh, to placebo arm. There was no difference. So again, this randomized control trial, the trial, it challenges the dogma of the value of uric acid lowering on hypertensive management, hypertension management. Another study which is very important and it is uh, the domain of the multidisciplinary care of the patients of her patients who has renal mass and it can be uh, safely treated with partial nephrectomy it's better to use partial nephrectomy because it preserves nephrons and uh, also has good prognosis i'm not going to discuss it in details another interesting observation is uh, pregnancy induces induced sensitization all of us know this uh, to the extent that it may lead to disparity in living kidney uh, living donor kidney transplantation for women so women can find a donor uh, uh, by difficulty so the chance of women to to have a live donor is less than men because maybe due to pregnancy induced sensitization and currently we are working in this uh, issue uh, to see our experience in this field. The last slide is um, we, uh, we have less than uh, two weeks to reach Ramadan and the Ramadan in Muslim world is the, uh, the month of uh, absolute fasting. So this is a nice uh, guidelines, practical guidelines regarding diabetic persons uh, in Ramadan and that was released in April uh, this year and the most important table within this guideline is to categorize patients into very high risk so this is the list of very high risk 
the patient, if the diabetic patient has one or more of the following severe hypoglycemia within three months prior to Ramadan, so we should know the risk and know the history of the patient, unexplained DKA within three months prior to Ramadan, hyperosmolar hyperglycemic coma within three months prior to Ramadan, history of recurrent hypoglycemia, history of hypoglycemic unawareness, poorly controlled type 1 diabetes, acute illness, all these carry the list of very high risk. And here, listen to medical advice, must not fast. Also, in this list, pregnancy and pre-existing diabetes uh, or gestational diabetes treated with insulin or sulfonylurea, chronic dialysis, uh, or stage four and five is in very high risk group. All the age with ill health, advanced uh, macrovascular complications. So if diabetic patient has one or more of this list, the patient must obey, must not fast. And the second group is the patient with high risk. So again, in high risk, also it is better to advise patients not to fast. And this is the list of patients who are diabetic and having one or more of the following. Type 2 diabetes with sustained poor glycemic control, will control type 1 diabetes, will control type 2 on multidisciplinary or mixed insulin, pregnant type 2 diabetes or gestational diabetes controlled by diet only or metformin, a stage 3 chronic kidney disease, estimated GFR less than 30, 60 milli per minute in a diabetic patient, a stable macrovascular complication, patients with comorbid conditions that present additional risk factors, people with diabetes performing intensive physical lay exercise, treatment with drug that may affect the cognitive function. So all these are high risk and listen to medical advice shouldn't fast. So for very high risk and for high risk groups of diabetic persons, the advice is not too fast. This is, uh, this is, should be a consistent advice from the medical personnel, from physicians. And here, the presence of dialysis stage four or five CKD is within the very high risk group. Stage three, SMIG FR uh, between 60 and 30 in the high risk group. So again, if you have diabetic person with chronic kidney disease, it, the advice is not too fast. Moderate and low risk, this is the category. And here, listen to medical advice. Decision here should be individualized. Uh, and the medical opinion here can be, discuss, can be discussed with the patient. Uh, and the most important points, if the patient insisted too fast, we should know how to address the management of diabetes in this population. Regarding kidney disease, my own perspective is if the patient has stage coronary kidney disease, stage 1 and 2, I may allow him to fast, but stage 3 with rapid progression, stage 4 or 5, dialysis patients, transplants with allograft function, and even transplants with normal graft function, but the immune suppressive drug should be given every 12 hours and we have this year Ramadan in the the day in Ramadan is 16 hours so uh, I cannot uh, go uh, uh, in an opposite direction for the pharmacokinetics so it's uh, my advice for all uh, transplant recipients receiving for example tacrolimus every 12 hours to not too fast and if there is any allograft function not too fast, this is a necessity because here, even in this long days with hot weather, the kidney is not, the kidney renal tubules are not working proper. There is no capacity to concentrate urine. So my advice for all these persons, not too fast. For the uh, patients with polyuria, for severe hypertension, for generalized edema that is stated uh, diuretics and the multi, polypharmacy drugs, all these persons uh, should be advised not to fast, and this is from my perspectives. Up to this point, I should end the presentation with the advice for all to read, always read. 
live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live to forever. And the most important point, yes, we should read, but we should keep eye, our eyes on the patients because as William Osler stated, he who studies medicine without books sails an uncharted sea. Uncharted sea means that the sea is not known, so it is not known for him, so he doesn't know his pathway. But he who studies medicine without patience doesn't go to sea at all. So it is better to read, to learn, and to be working closely with our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, please send it to my mail.